So why would anyone be lazy after knowing this? And some people say it's too difficult to get up and to wash and to pray and so on. So we say, thank Allah that He made you physically able and capable of performing the salah. There are those who are blind and paralyzed and struggling to submit to their Creator. Abdullah ibn Umm Maktoum, one of the companions, he was a blind man radiallahu anhu. He asked the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa he says, O Prophet of Allah, I am a blind man and my house is far away from the masjid. Is it possible to grant me permission to say the prayer in my house? So the Prophet sallallahu tells him, yes. You can pray in your house. So Ibn Umm Maktoum radiallahu anhu starts to leave. And then the Prophet ﷺ calls him. And he says, do you hear the call to salah? And he says, yes. So the Prophet ﷺ says, then respond to it. In another narration, I do not find any excuse or any permission for you to not come to the salah. So if anyone was to be excused from the salah, it would have been the one who is fighting for the sake of Allah. It would have been the blind man. It would have been the sick person. But even the sick will either pray standing, and if they cannot stand, they will sit, and if they cannot sit, they will lie down on their side. And yet you are given health, and yet you still don't pray to Allah Azza wa Jal. The famous doctor and philosopher Ibn Sina, rahimahullah, he says he recalls a moment in his life, it was a cold and very icy night, and he and his slave were resting at a, an inn in a remote part of Khurasan. And during the night he became thirsty. So he called to his servant to bring him some water. And the servant didn't want to leave his warm bed. It was a cold night. So he pretended not to hear Ibn Sina's call. But then after he starts calling on him and calling on him, he reluctantly got up and he went to bring some water. And then a little while later, he hears the sound of the adhan filling the air. And then Ibn Sina begins to think about this mu'addin who is calling the people to salah. And he thinks, my servant Abdullah always respects me and admires me. And he tries to take every opportunity to praise me and to serve me. But tonight, he preferred his own comfort to my needs. While on the other hand, look at this Persian servant of Allah. He leaves his warm bed and he goes out into the cold night and he makes ablution wudu with this icy water from the stream. And then he goes up high to the minaret and to the masjid to glorify Allah and say, Ashhadu an la ilaha illallah. So then he says, that I learned the essence of true love, the love which results in complete obedience. And dear listeners, the love of Allah Azza wa Jal demands total and unconditional obedience. So the question is, do you love Allah Azza wa Jal? If so, then where is your obedience to Allah? Where is your salah? Or perhaps this laziness is actually a, a kind of arrogance. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala promises in the Qur'an, إِنَّ الَّذِينَ يَسْتَكْبِرُونَ عَنْ عِبَادَتِي سَيَدْخُلُونَ جَهَنَّمَ دَاخِرِينَ Verily those who are too arrogant to worship me will enter the hellfire abased, degraded or humiliated. And they will get the punishment just the opposite of what was preventing them. On earth, they were too arrogant to worship Allah, so Allah will humiliate them on the day of resurrection. And how can you be too arrogant to stand in front of Allah Azza wa Jal in all His greatness? And Allah in all His greatness, when you stand in front of Him, He turns and He looks at you. That's why the early Muslims used to say, when you stand in front of Allah, stand with a devout frame of mind, and be mindful of turning, meaning looking around in your salah. Be careful not to look around in your salah. And look why they say. So that while Allah is looking at you, you are looking at something else. And just imagine that Allah Azza wa Jal, in all His magnificence and His greatness and His glory, you're standing and praying to Him and He's looking at you. And while He's looking at you, you start to look at something else. You start to look at the watch, start to look at things on the ground and patterns on the floor, while Allah Azza wa Jal is looking at you. And wallahi, if someone did this to you, when you look at them and speak to them, they turn away from you, you wouldn't appreciate that. So why would you ever do that to your Lord subhanahu wa ta'ala? And how can you be too arrogant when Allah describes Al-Mu'minun, in Surah Al-Mu'minun, Allah describes the believers. Allah first begins by describing the people who are successful and prosperous. So Allah Azza wa Jal says, قَدْ أَفْلَحَ الْمُؤْمِنُونَ So the first thing Allah describes, the people who are successful, and their first description is that they're mu'minun, that they're believers. 
And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, الَّذِينَ هُمْ فِي صَلَاتِهِمْ خَاشِعُونَ Then Allah describes the believers and their first description is that they are humble in their salah. That they feel this focus and humility while they're praying to Allah azza wa jal. And there are those people who say that work is worship. Al-amal ibadah, that the Prophet ﷺ said, work is worship. So when we're at work, we don't pray because work itself is worship. So we have Nawfal ibn Mu'awiyah radiallahu anhu narrates that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa said whoever missed the prayer then it is as if he had lost his family and his wealth. So the question is how would you feel if you were to lose your son or your father or your mother or your wife or everything that you own? How would you feel if you lost your family? And what if you lose your family and your wealth? And we ask Allah to protect you and your family. But leaving salah for the sake of wealth is equivalent to losing both family and wealth. So how can it be an excuse to not pray? And if you go out and you buy a shoe, and when you come home you find that the shoe is too small for you, do you get a saw or a knife and you cut away from your foot? Obviously, you change the shoe. So do you cut away from your salah and squeeze the time of your salah at the end of the day because of work? Or do you change your work schedule so you can pray? And the salah barely takes with its wudu and everything else more than 10 minutes. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala describes certain people in the Qur'an who did this to the salah times. They messed up their salah times because of whatever reason they had. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala describes them in Surah Maryam saying, فَخَلَفَ مِن بَعْدِهِمْ خَلْفٌ أَضَاعُوا الصَّلَاةَ وَاتَّبُعُوا الشَّهَوَاتِ فَسَوْفَ يَلْقَوْنَ غَيَّةِ That there has succeeded them a group of people who Allah Salah literally they lost the salah. So they are going to their punishment, they're going to get ghay. This is the punishment of these people that they're going to get ghay. What is ghay and what is this ayah talking about? Ghay is from the hellfire. So when this ayah was revealed, the Prophet وسلم, asked Jibreel, he said, Will my people abandon salah? And the Prophet وسلم, is so concerned that his ummah is going to leave the salah after his death. So then Jibreel alayhi salam explains that a people at the end of times will come who will sell their religion for this dunya. A dirham to them is better than salah. This is what Jibreel tells the Prophet That a dirham, this currency, is better for them than salah. So then what is this ghay that they're going to be thrown into? And Abdullah ibn Abbas, one of the scholars amongst the companions of the Prophet wasallam. He says, Allah's salah, which literally means lost salah, doesn't mean that they totally abandoned it, but they used to combine it. So they get ghay. This is the punishment, is ghay. And what is ghay? It is a valley in the hellfire that is so fierce that the rest of the hellfire seeks refuge from it every day. It's a place, a valley in the hellfire that is so horrible that the rest of hellfire seeks refuge with Allah from that part of the hellfire. That's how horrible the punishment is for the one who does what? For the one who combines their prayers. They pray, but they combine their prayers, they mix up the times. So what about those who don't even pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? And there are others that complain that they have so many sins. And they say that one day I'm going to repent and I'm going to start praying. So the response to that is from the Prophet wasallam, where he says that if a person had a stream outside his door and he bathed in it five times a day, so someone in front of his house, he has a running stream and he will bathe in that stream five times every day. The Prophet wasallam then asked, do you think that he will have any filth left on him? And the people said, no, no filth would remain on him whatsoever. And then the Prophet wasallam said, that is like the five daily prayers. Allah wipes away the sins by the five daily prayers, by them. And what does that mean if you have these five prayers like a river to wash your sins? It means that when you meet Allah on the Day of Judgment, you're going to meet Allah while you're clean, inshaAllah. Abdullah ibn Mas'ud radiallahu anhu says, A man came to the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wasallam and he confessed that he kissed a woman, a woman he's not married to and he kissed her. So he comes to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam and he confesses of this sin. So then when he does that, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reveals an ayah. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَأَقِمِ الصَّلَاةَ تَرَفَيِ النَّهَارِ 
وزلفا من الليل إن الحسنات يذهبن السيئات ذلك ذكرا للذاكرين الله سبحانه وتعالى reveals and establish regular prayers at the two ends of the day and at the approaches of the night for those that are good remove those that are evil that is a reminder for the mindful so the good deeds remove the bad deeds so then the man asked if the revelation was only for him was this ayah just revealed for me is this a case specific to me and the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam said it is for all of my nation and you are included in this as well